Hey team, how are you guys doing? Hey Mark Anthony. Good to see you guys. You too. 30 seconds. Now, good evening. I want to call this meeting of the Durham City Council to order at seven o'clock p.m. on June the 1st, 2020. I certainly want to welcome everyone here tonight. I want to thank those people who are listening and watching how whatever form that might be tonight from home or wherever you are and welcome you to this meeting of the Durham City Council. I want to thank our staff and our tech staff, our public affairs staff and others for making it possible for us to broadcast the meeting in this way. As we have our moment of silent meditation tonight, and I'll ask you to join me in that moment, that silent meditation in a moment, I ask us all to remember George Floyd, his family, his friends, all who loved him, and to keep them in our hearts. Please join me in a moment of silent meditation. Thank you. And now I'll ask Councilmember Reese if he'll lead us in the pledge to the flag. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think I've gotten myself unmuted now. And good evening, colleagues and members of the public who are listening at home. I will now recite the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, council member. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Mayor Shule. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Here. Council member Caballero. Here. Council member Freeman. Present. Council member Middleton. Council member Reese. Here. Thank you. I'm here. Thank Sorry, you. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And now we will go to announcements by members of the council. Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to say a few words tonight about the um, experience that we're having this last week in our country. Um, I wanna first express my solidarity with the families, friends, and communities of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, um, and Arbery and all of the victims of police and racist vigilante violence across the United States. I wanna send my love to everyone who's been out in the streets over the last few days to honor their lives and to um, my fellow elected officials here in North Carolina and around the country who've joined their constituents in the streets, including um, three members of our city council. As we've tried to mitigate the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic and the economic crisis that it's caused, the many other social ills that we face as a country have continued unabated, including the epidemic of white supremacy that began with the colonization and founding of our country and continues today. As a mother of two black boys, my family and I face the consequences of this epidemic every day. A few months ago, I sent my 13 year old son to a neighbor's home to give them a misdelivered package and I waited on my front porch the whole time, anxiously um, waiting to see if he was going to make it home okay. I regularly see posts from neighbors on listservs reporting the presence of black people in their neighborhoods as if we don't have the right to exist on the streets. 
As a child in the 1980s, my mother warned my younger brother not to play with toy guns so the police wouldn't think he had a real gun and shoot him. Decades later, the only thing that's really changed is that the ubiquity of phone cameras and live streaming technology has brought the reality of this experience to a new and broader audience. Over the last few days, police forces across the country have recklessly and needlessly escalated conflicts with demonstrators in Minneapolis, New York, Atlanta, Charlotte, Raleigh, and other cities, and even shot and killed David McAddy, an unarmed black resident in Louisville, Kentucky. Police have responded to nonviolent demonstrations with chemical and projectile weapons. They've attacked journalists, causing serious injuries that have been documented on video and film, and have ironically caused these abuses to be reported on accurately, which is extremely rare. Even more disturbingly, right-wing paramilitaries and provocateurs have traveled to many cities, including cities right here in North Carolina, in order to start conflicts with police and manipulate this outpouring of resistance to police violence to satisfy their own political goals. Many have pointed out the obvious difference in the way that police forces across the country have responded to this current wave of protests in contrast to the recent wave of armed right-wing defiance of stay-at-home orders that were almost entirely left alone by law enforcement, even when they shut down the entire state legislature in Michigan. Here in Durham, we're fortunate to have both elected and police leadership that value de-escalation and non-confrontational approaches to demonstrations. I want to appreciate the work of our police chief, CJ Davis, and her staff in avoiding needless conflicts with demonstrators over the last few days. I also want to appreciate the work of the many community leaders and, organ and organizers and organizations who have spent much of the last decade doing the hard work of pushing a police reform agenda to this point. Without their work, we wouldn't have the leadership that we have today in the city. And as many of us remember the response to the protests of Jesus Huerta's death just over six years ago, we know how different things used to be. We're in a much better place today with our new police chief and with different leadership in our city. But I also want to caution us against feeling superior to other cities or, the, or acting like policing issues don't exist here too. Our city still spends a significant and growing amount of money on policing. We still have a significant racial disparity in, in traffic stops. We have use of force policies that don't follow best practices. We're preempted by the state from implementing transparent body camera policies. We don't have functional civilian oversight or review board with any real authority to enforce changes in practices. Again, that's an issue where we're preempted by the state of North Carolina. We've made a lot of progress here in Durham, but we still have a long way to go to get where we need to be. So there's important work to do here in Durham as there is around the country to continue to move toward a safer and healthier community for all of us. Just before the COVID pandemic hit, we passed bylaws for a community safety and wellness task force and invited Durham County and the Durham School Board to join us in implementing this new board. Understandably, COVID has delayed much of our work, but I'll be following up with our colleagues on the County Commission and School Board to make sure that this work can begin as soon as possible. I continue to support calls from community members to invest public money in community safety outside of policing, as well as education, healthcare, housing, recreation, economic inclusion, and building a stronger and more inclusive democracy. I continue to be troubled by the amount of money that we spend on policing that I know could be spent on more effective community-based interventions to promote safety and wellness in Durham. But we have to build those systems. We have to create those interventions. Um, and I've been a strong advocate for, for changing these spending priorities in the past, and I'll continue to advocate for different priorities in the future. The only way out is through. We won't solve these problems until we address systemic racism in all of our institutions, but especially in our criminal legal system. Until we do, Black people will continue to suffer disproportionately from a system that values property, wealth, business, and the maintenance of the status quo over Black lives. This is a rough time for a lot of us, and so I also just wanted to take a moment to remind everyone to take care of yourself and take care of each other. I've been doing movement work for 20 years, and I'm regularly in the streets with people who've been doing this work for 50 years or more, and I believe them when they say it's a marathon, not a sprint. Take some time for yourself and have some energy left to fight tomorrow and the next day and the next day for the better world that we all deserve. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you so much, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Who else would like to uh, speak during announcements? Councilmember Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, colleagues, and good evening to all uh, who are watching. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna thank my uh, colleague, Mayor, uh, Madam Mayor Pro Tem uh, Johnson for, for saying some critically important things. I think we need to hear in Durham sure. and around the nation this evening. I, um, Mr. Mayor, you've gaveled us into session this evening while chaos is, is going on in our country uh, tonight. Um, 
much of what's going on uh, this evening and has been going on for the past week, Mr. Mayor, I believe is actually just unsettled business uh, that America has had on its ledger uh, since before its birth, since before its inception. Uh, those matters are still rearing their head uh, even today. Um, so I want to I want to firstly uh, just commend you and thank you, Mr. Mayor, on the leadership you provided uh, for a number of mayors who signed the wonderful statement that I think captured the heart of our city. It's no wasn't surprised to me at all that the mayor of Durham uh, would be at the forefront uh, of that effort. I was extremely proud, uh, particularly given the dearth of leadership we have coming uh, from the highest levels of our government. Uh, sometimes we at the local level, it feels like we're on our own as mayors and council people and, and others. So I want to thank you for your leadership. I also want to commend, um, likewise, uh, uh, Chief Davis, and their department on, on what I thought was a great job that they did this past weekend uh, in maintaining a profile that was very low. Um, they actually assisted a movement rather than hindered it, uh, non-confrontational, non-intimidating uh, uh, um, type presence as we're seeing uh, other departments uh, exhibit around the country. Um, I do want to echo um, Mayor Pro Tem's admonishment not to get too cocky or, or to get too comfortable because we had uh, pretty much um, event-free uh, demonstration this weekend. There are rumors that, that folk aren't too happy with the, some folk aren't too happy with the way things went uh, this past weekend and they plan on trying to, to assert themselves in our city. And I just wanna uh, issue a call tonight uh, to folk that, I, that I've worked with over the years, over the decades and allied with on, on work in this city. Whether we've agreed or not, philosophically, and sometimes we've had differences in philosophy, never in the end result, uh, but I think philosophically, I, I wanna call on those that have done the work and who are uh, um, lovers of this city. If you're gonna be in the streets tonight, uh, to keep our eyes open for those who don't really love us, who don't care about the Floyd family, who don't share our tears, but are here to co-op and preempt us. This is Durham. We know the difference between a Confederate monument and a mom and pop store where we get milk and vegetables for our babies. We don't need to be uh, uh, told uh, the difference between those two things. We understand it here in Durham. We understand the difference uh, between a pharmacy and a symbol of oppression. Uh, and the fire's already been lit in, in Durham. The fire's been lit in our hearts. The fire's been lit in our spirits and our souls. The fire's already burning in Durham yeah. uh, for equity and for justice. So I'm, I'm just imploring those of us that, that know Durham, those of us that love Durham, if we're out in the streets tonight, uh, as we mourn, as we have this collective outpouring of grief and resolve uh, to finish the unfinished business of the United States of America, uh, to make us be who we say we are, if you've got a little bit of energy also to keep your eyes open for those who aren't down with us, who aren't down with the movement, keep an eye out for those who would seek to take advantage of our pain and take advantage of our tears uh, this evening. This is Durham. This is the Bull City. So we know Bull. And we don't need anybody bringing any more bull into the bull city. So I'm calling on friends and allies tonight to keep your eyes open as we hit the streets. We continue to express solidarity with, with the name, all the names that the mayor pro tem has called, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd. And to those countless names we will never know about because no cameras were present. We will finish the work of making us who we say we are as a country. And I think Durham is going to be ground zero for it. May God bless the Floyd family. God bless his memory. God bless Durham. Black Lives Matter. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much, Council Member. Would anyone else like to speak? Is there anyone else that would like to speak during announcements? I would, Mr. Mayor. Council Member Freeman. Thank you. I, I don't want to um, repeat what's been said, and I really appreciate all that's been said from um, Mayor Pro Tem and Council Member Middleton. I do want to um, uplift just how hard um, it is to kind of come face to face with this, um, as I, I think someone gave me the term, uninvited mental health trauma. And being able to um, be, a, be amongst so many people in this city, I'm just so, I'm overwhelmed with the pride of how we've handled um, our own grief and our own hurt and our, healing that's needed right now. I, um, I'm so grateful to, uh, to the work that's been done over the years. Um, and I'll probably remain um, off the video because it's been 
I'm just not fit for public consumption. And I've been trying my best to not do this because I always do. And loss of life, any life is hard. And loss at the hands of an officer who is supposed to protect and serve is, is it's the hardest to swallow, especially, oh my gosh. And I don't wanna keep, keep um, going down this road, but I do wanna say that it's important. It is really important. And I'm speaking specifically to black people in this city that you do take time and you acknowledge the hurt, the harm and the pain that you're feeling. Um, there are no words. I can feel it in my bones. I can feel it all throughout my body. The trauma I'm carrying is, it's just in my DNA. And it is the reason I do what I do, how I do it. And I wanna be mindful of the fact that, that these issues around race and racism are with us and we have to address them. We have to be willing to have those hard conversations and we have to be willing to do more than that and moving towards the actions. I know that today on a call with uh, the National Urban League and NAACP and other civil rights leaders, five years ago, a commission was pulled together federally to address this so that none of our states would have to go through this same type of angst and whether or not officers would be charged. And we're still at the same place of ground zero nationally. I'm grateful to the work that our officers are doing here in Durham. I'm grateful to Chief Davis. And I, I, I really want to just reiterate just how far we have to go. Um, and that none of us are exempt from doing this work, but uh, I really appreciate all that everyone is, is pulling, uh, putting forward and trying to move us forward in this. And um, just want to thank you. Councilmember, thank you so much. And I think we all understand anybody's need to be off camera some tonight under these circumstances. Councilmember Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm, as always, just amazed at my colleagues and uh, the way that they can talk about these issues and the way that marries the deep uh, personal connection they have to this work with the very deep policy knowledge that each of them brings. And I just wanna thank the Mayor Pro Tem, uh, Councilmember Middleton, Councilmember Freeman for expressing what we're all feeling tonight. Uh, Mr. Mayor, our country is in crisis tonight. Um, around the country, we have seen uh, really an epidemic of police violence that has uh, that we only know the slightest bit of because some folks happened to video record it. Um, that's certainly the case uh, in the killing of George Floyd. Um, Breonna Taylor is another victim of police violence. Uh, Ahmaud Aubrey was a victim of vigilante violence. Uh, but these these incidents have really shocked the conscience of our nation yet again, and have drawn our attention yet again uh, to the epidemic of police violence that continue to plague uh, these United States. And this is an epidemic that of course is the natural outgrowth of America's original sins of uh, racism and white supremacy, really our original and still ongoing sins um, that insidiously uh, seek to value black lives less than white ones. It's the result of a rampaging out of control flavor of capitalism that enlists police violence as a means to protect private property, uh, all too often punishing small acts like attempted forgery um, with the death of those alleged to have committed them. And finally, it's the end product of a decades long legal pro project to provide almost absolute immunity to law enforcement officers for some of the most heinous acts they perform in the line of duty. Now the solutions to ending this epidemic are clear. We all know them. More accountability for police officers and law enforcement officers, better use of force guidelines and more resources for community solutions that keep our community safe outside of the context of law enforcement. And I'm proud to say that this city council has been on the forefront of that work and we must redouble our efforts in the weeks and months to come. The people of this city demand it, they need it, and they have to have it. Mr. Mayor, this weekend here in Durham, we saw a day long protest in downtown Durham that did not feature some of the kinds of police provocation and overreaction that we saw in other cities, both here in North Carolina and around the country. Uh, that response uh, to protest was a testament um, on the one hand to the leadership of Durham's 
fantastic crew chief, C.J. Davis, um, but perhaps just as importantly to the hard work of hundreds of persistent and passionate community leaders uh, over a course of generations that made that kind of police leadership and the leadership that we've seen on this city council possible. Uh, and tonight, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, as Councilmember Middleton alluded to, protesters are back in the streets of Durham asking simply that America stop killing black folks and that our government at all levels take concrete action to make that promise a reality for every resident. Black Lives Matter, Mr. Mayor, as you know as well as I do. And if we wanna live up to what that promise truly represents, we must have turned to that work now. And I look forward to reaching out on those issues in the days and weeks to come. I thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you so much, Council Member. Council Member Caballero. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone, my colleagues, city staff, and everyone uh, in the community who's joining us tonight. Uh, thank you to all my colleagues for their remarks. Uh, I think we're all struggling right now. Um, when we rang in 2020, in what seems like a lifetime ago, I know we never thought that two pandemics would collide in the manner that they have this year. One of our pandemics is, is new, coronavirus. It's taken the life of over 100,000 US Americans and many thousands across the globe. Coronavirus virus leaves us in a place of uncertainty. What our future brings is unclear in many ways, but it's a virus, something unpredictable, biological, and its design right now is beyond our control. The second pandemic I wanna talk about is structural racism. This pandemic is not beyond our control, is not biological, and it is not unpredictable. It has been constructed and renewed for over 400 years, and black folks have suffered its traumas while white folks have benefited. One of the latest and most public examples of racism in our country was George Floyd's murder, right on the heel of Breonna Taylor and Ahmed Arbery, all lynched by police or white supremacists. Many of us have taken to the streets in protest and grief, and we have seen the response in cities across this country due to the militarization of the police. In Durham, we have tried to take a different approach. And while our work is imperfect and incomplete, when my daughter and I attended the protests here in Durham on Saturday, the, res the police response was markedly different than what we have seen on social media and in the news. And I wanna applaud Chief Davis for her diligent work. She's done a remarkable job changing the culture in Durham's police department. But I would be remiss if I did not also applaud and acknowledge the years of work of so many dedicated community members who on a daily basis remind us we must, must, we must be ever vigilant of our past. I especially want to champion the work of so many black women who have dedicated their lives and labor and forced us to implement changes here in Durham around police violence. These community leaders have constantly shown us the way, the path, the way forward and I'm grateful for their sacrifices. I wanna end on this note, our work ahead will, be, will continue to be painful and hard. I will be listening to and taking the lead from black folks. I will continue to do work on my own racism as I know how deep and rampant anti-blackness is rooted within the Latinx community. I will continue to teach my children to be anti-racist. And I hope all of us will say the words Black Lives Matter over and over again, like a prayer, like a mantra, until those words are no longer necessary because of the promise of justice and equity, because the promise of justice and equity has been delivered. Thank you. Thank you so much, council member. Colleagues, those were fantastic, fantastic words. And I'm so grateful to each of you for those powerful expressions. I will, uh, I don't have anything to add, except I do wanna read the statement uh, that council member Middleton alluded to. On Saturday midday, I realized that one of the ways to try to fill the vacuum in leadership in this country about the murder of George Floyd was to have local leadership talk about the murder of George Floyd, what it meant. And how we should respond. So I drafted this, sent it to a couple of other mayors, thought I might get a few mayors to sign on. Um, and it took on a life of its own. Um, we now have more than 80 mayors in North Carolina 
cities and towns who have signed on and more are coming all the time. So I want to read the statement. It's very brief. North Carolina mayor's statement on the murder of George Floyd. As mayors of cities in North Carolina, we have come together to express our abhorrence of the horrific murder of George Floyd, an act of unspeakable violence, cold inhumanity, and racism. The photographic evidence of this act speaks for itself. Mr. Floyd was suffocated to death by a Minneapolis police officer while pleading for his life as three other officers knelt or stood by and did nothing to help him, even as he called out, I can't breathe. As a, as a society, we cannot tolerate this kind of police violence rooted in systemic racism. As mayors, we work closely with the public police leadership in our cities, and we know that they also will not tolerate this kind of police violence and racism within their forces. Such acts not only harm innocent people, but they also deeply erode trust in our police forces, despite the good work of so many officers every day. Officers who themselves abhor the racism and violence so evident in the death of George Floyd. Our hearts go out to Mr. Floyd and his family. We support Mayor Jacob Fry of Minneapolis in his call for justice and accountability. We expect a full and fair trial with police officers involved. We also support the rights of those who are peacefully protesting and honoring the memory of George Floyd and countless others that have been victims of systemic racism and police violence. Let's work together to ensure that protests remain peaceful and stay focused on building equitable and just cities for all in North Carolina. And we pledge to make every effort within our power to fight systemic racism within our police forces, cities, and this nation. And signed by mayors from Murphy to Manio. Uh, and we will, uh, uh, this has just been released on social media with more of these signatures. And as more come in, we'll continue to do that. So, Again, thank you all so much for your words. They were very, very powerful. And we need to continue to do this work. The words are important, and we know that to need, we need to do the work that goes along with it. So thank you so much, colleagues. We'll now move on to priority items, and we'll begin with the city manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Members of city council, good evening. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I want to reiterate uh, so many of the words that you all have so eloquently said. I think at this time, political leadership, local politi political leadership is what is going to get us through uh, this uh, terribly tragic place we find ourselves in today. And I want to thank you and all the members of council for your willingness to speak out, but also trust C.J. Davis, the Chief of Police. Uh, Chief Davis and I are continuing to work very closely together as we've addressed the challenge, but I don't want to take an ounce of the credit. Uh, she deserves uh, the credit uh, that has been put her way as she has over the last several years truly transformed many aspects of the Durham Police Department. Are we perfect? No. Uh, we have a ways to go, but we're, we are along, along the way of a path that I think is going to lead to a much better uh, uh, relationship and much better outcomes, particularly at times of crisis like this. So I think this is a time for local political leadership, political statements, not administrative statements. So I don't, I, I don't want to spend too much time on that. Also want to mention this evening, uh, as some of you know, I had a procedure today that uh, actually is limiting me to get a suit coat on this evening. Uh, so instead I looked for a short sleeve black shirt that I thought would be appropriate to, uh, to wear uh, an acknowledgement of the, the 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 darkness that is facing us right now, but also one that I am hopeful uh, that we will, uh, for, particularly in Durham, uh, find our way out of. So thank you. I uh, just have some very minor uh, items this evening where on four of the agenda items, we've added additional information that uh, council had requested at the work session, but those are my only priority items. And thank you again for your support and in particular your support of Chief Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Manager. Madam Attorney. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, members of City Council. Um, before I tell you I don't have any priority items, I want to say thank you so much for your words 
um, it is incredibly edifying and encouraging to work for a governing council that has such political courage and such strong conviction about justice and equality in this country. I can tell you that um, my staff and I spend a lot of time kind of expressing our appreciation amongst one another and our pride in, in our city, um, both in the courageous leaders that are in the community, but also the courageous leaders that are on this council. So thank you so much for allowing us to serve. If there's anything the city attorney's office can do to help facilitate um, the work that you all are doing on this front, please don't hesitate to ask us. We are, we are ready to go and we have no prayer with Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam Attorney. Madam Clerk. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, City Council. Um, I just wanted to thank you also for your words of um, courage and, and uh, equity and to trust everyone in Durham to do the right thing. And I do have a priority item. It is um, for public comments to be heard and accepted after the public hearings tonight. There is an email box that's been created and the email is publichearing.comment at durhamnc.gov. The P and the H in public hearing are capitalized and then there's a dot and then comment is capitalized with a C. And if anyone would like to make comments after the meeting tonight for the next 72 hours, we will be accepting your comments. Uh, so that's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Madam Clerk, would you repeat the, the email again? Certainly. It's publichearing.comment at durhamnc.gov. The P and the H in public hearing are capitalized. Then there's the dot and then the capital C in comment. So we will be accepting comments after the meeting tonight for 72 hours. Thank you, Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. We'll now move to the consent agenda. The consent agenda is made up of items that the council has been working on previously. The, the consent agenda can be approved by a single vote of the council unless an item is pulled by a council member or a member of the public, in which case the item will be heard at the end of the meeting. Consent agenda item one, approval of city council minutes. Item two, participatory budgeting PB grant agreement with El Futuro Incorporated. Item three, interlocal agreement with Durham County for the sharing of sales tax revenue. Item four, amend the FY1920 budget internal service fund spending plan and other grant and capital project ordinances and amendments. Item five, loan commitment to Development Ventures Inc. for Commerce Street Seniors Apartments. Item six, loan commitment to Durham Housing Authority, Durham Development Ventures Inc. for Elizabeth Street Apartments. Item seven, contract amendment number one for the installation of federally funded U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, signalized pedestrian improvements. Item eight, Austin Avenue sidewalk project. Item nine, interlocal agreement for mobile ticketing. Item 10, mobile ticketing system. Item 11, transit fare capping policy. Item 13, insurance plan FY21. Item 14, bid report April 2020. Uh, item 15, cooperative group purchase contract, seven Sutfen heavy duty, fully customized pumpers for the Durham Fire Department. Item 16, contract with Lanier Tree Services LLC for the removal of trees. And I want to thank the administration and the Lanier Tree Services for the additional information on their um, hiring. That was uh, excellent to receive. Item 17, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development HUD 2020 Partnership Initiative Grant. General, uh, those are the consent agenda items. And I'll take a motion now for the approval of the consent agenda. Move approval. Second. And moved by, moved by the mayor pro tem and seconded by council member Middleton that we approve the consent agenda. Mr. Madam Mr. Clerk. Before you vote, I just wanted to make a comment. Uh-huh. There were a, a couple of items on the agenda that I know committed, community members mentioned not being able to get comments in on. And I just want to highlight, it's the, I think it's, uh, it's item two, uh, four, hold on, sorry. So, so 
was items two, 27, and I know there was a stormwater fee and the water fees and the participatory budgeting. I just want to note that the the fact that we only had about four or five comments is definitely out of the ordinary. And so just noting that this process um, needs to be a little bit more fleshed out so that we're figuring out how to reach more people or making sure that people who aren't online have access. Um, uh, and that, that, that's just pretty much it. I just want to make sure that we're, we're figuring out what it is that, that's missing because uh, four or five comments definitely seems really low. Thank you, council member. And I do want to uh, remind all council members that we have received those comments uh, and were made available to us by the clerk and I appreciate it. Thank you, council member. Thank you. Can I have a, uh, so we, we have a motion in a second. Madam Clerk, will you please call the vote? Mayor Shule. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Aye. Council Member Caballero. Aye. Council Member Freeman. Aye. Council Member Middleton. I vote yay. And Council Member Reese. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The ayes have it and the motion passes unanimously. We'll now move to our general business agenda, public hearings. Um, Although we've had one public hearing, tonight's public hearings are going to be more difficult, technically. And I want to uh, really thank the clerk and our technical staff for working so hard on this. And I think I've been remiss in previous meetings also in not thanking the clerk and the clerk staff. They have been such a huge part of making the technology go here. And uh, so, Madam Clerk, please, um, please accept our appreciation. Um, our first item is general business agenda public hearing FY 2021 budget FY 20 to 21 to 26 capital improvement program CIP. And uh, we'll now hear from, I believe, um, well, I see, I see Bertha Johnson, Ms. Johnson. Good evening, Mayor, members of council. Bertha Johnson, Director of Budget and Management Services. This is a, an event. Um, for us to have an opportunity to receive comments from the public on the fiscal year 2021 budget and capital improvement plan. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Are there any questions by council members at this time? Thank you so much. Um, and we'll now move to public comment. Uh, Madam Clerk, um, do we have public comment for this item? Mayor Shul, we have, as far as I'm aware, Nathaniel Gertner and water management employee are signed up for the budget item. All right, thank you so much. Um, and so I'll, uh, is, is Mr. Gertner available to, to speak to us, Madam Clerk? Yes, sir. <laughs> just unmuted him. Mr. Gartner, welcome. We're glad to have you. And uh, uh, you we, you have, uh, is your camera working, do you know, or is I, are you just calling in by phone? Uh, just audio. Okay, great. We're glad to have you and you have three minutes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, my name is Nathaniel Gartner. I live in Durham, uh, 307 East Hammond Street, and I'm here to talk about the police department budget as part of this. Uh, the proposed budget. Um, I believe we need to divest as a community and as a government from the institution of policing. Uh, this budget proposes 681 full time positions for the police, which is over 200 more than any other department, where the budget is 68 million, which is a third of our general fund. And I have to ask what we're getting for this cost. I can't tell you a single incident in my neighborhood that required the response to armed people trained in lethal force. I can tell you that every day in my neighborhood, I can see people who need housing and food and medical care and for someone in official capacity to reach out with these services. Each Wednesday, I see cars lined up around the block for a local for church food pantry. And we fund the police at such a level rather than expanding public services at the poverty of our imagination of what government can be. If we cannot conceive of a city without substantial policing, is it because policing has become our default response to community issues? A police force feels stretched thin. It is because we ask the police to do too much, reaching far into realms where someone with different training could do it better and more efficiently. 
and I'm sensitive to the fact that 681 jobs is a lot of jobs, but these are not the jobs we need people doing right now. There are better ways to put people to work that build our community rather than simply exerting control. Beyond the issue of this opportunity cost, there's the question of utility. When it is commonly accepted that to threaten to call the police on a black person is a threat and a death sentence, how can any of us in good conscience consider this a service that we can use? How can this service provide its purported goal of safety to the over 100,000 black citizens of this city? And how can I support a service that works for me but endangers my neighbor? In the past week, we've seen dramatic demonstrations of how the police prioritize their own power over the interests of the populations they ostensibly serve. And of course, we can pat ourselves on the back for relatively peaceful protests here in Durham. One doesn't have to go that far back in history to find incidents of abuse and undue violence committed by our police force. Individual and cultural changes are admirable but fragile and cannot be depended on when structural issues remain. We know that the police is an institution that's built on violence. We know it promises safety for some and condemnation to an impoverished and abused criminal <laughs> class for others. And we hear about police reform, but we have evidence that training programs do not work to lower incidents of police violence or racial bias. We have evidence that body cameras are ineffective at creating accountability, and we can take away weapons, but no weapon was needed to murder George Floyd. I encourage this council and the mayor to look at this time of mass unemployment and economic crisis and see that maintaining the police budget is a disservice to our community. We must take the opportunity to refocus our resources on providing services that actually make all our people safer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Gertner. Um, we now have uh, someone who's identified only as water management employee. Uh, is that person available to the phone? How are you? Welcome. Thank you. You, you have uh, three minutes. I understand. I believe the city has misled its employees and their families by insinuating it'll need to tighten its belt for the hard times ahead by eradicating the merit pay increases for its city workers this year, all while holding a $35.4 million surplus in the general fund. And when merit raises would only cost the city six, Point nine million from that fund, still leaving the city with a $28 million surplus. Tom Bonfield sent out a letter to city employees and their families saying he appreciates our frontline workers and the hard work that they do, but apparently not enough to give us our hard earned wage increases for putting our lives on the line and those of our families we return home to each day, potentially infecting due to a presently rapidly growing infection rate throughout the state and country upon reopening. We don't need empty words of appreciation. We want to see our dedications to our residents rewarded. City workers received a mass printed paper letter with a printed signature from our city manager with no monetary value. A letter that ended up in the trash by every underappreciated worker that read it and learned that their hard work for the year would once again go unnoticed all while the city furloughed parks and rec workers during a time when they needed money the most amidst this pandemic. We want to drop the excuses and give city workers the raises we earned for keeping this city alive during a pandemic. We see that six more police officers were approved in February, seven more are being asked to be approved now while you ignore the people that keep sewage out of your homes and clean water supplied to your faucets, trash out of your homes and from piling up on your properties and your streets swept and clean from debris. You say thank you to us while turning your back to us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Madam Clerk, do we have any other speakers on this item? Mayor, that's all I can tell that we have. We have multiple attendees, but I can't tell what they're here to speak about. I've received one, uh, one uh, chat from one of the um, attendees and they're gonna leave an email. Uh, they're gonna be writing us an email and okay. don't, don't want to speak. So I believe that's all. Okay, should I ask them if they want to speak to the budget? Uh, I see now that uh, Danielle Purifoy wants to speak to the budget and says she has signed up. Okay. So can you um, contact Ms. Purifoy? She's one of the uh, attendees. Okay, she's unmuted. 
Ms. Purifoy, are you with us? Here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Welcome, and you have three minutes. Thank you. Um, my name is Danielle Purifoy, and I'm here as a representative of Durham Beyond Policing, a coalition of Durham-based organizers who believe we can build a public safety system rooted in public resources and community accountability, not punishment and surveillance. Last year, we came before you with a counter proposal to the public safety budget, demanding that the council reject the increase of police officers in this city and with a proposal for a community led safety and wellness task force to bring forth alternatives to policing that, that prioritize care through resources, professional public health based support and community accountability and restorative justice practices. And we commend your support, those of you that supported us in that last year. But this year, in the middle of a pandemic that has killed over 100,000 people in this country and 944 people in North Carolina, in the midst of a $9 million budget shortfall, denials of city, wage, city employee wage increases in the face of possible layoffs and many evictions pending the lift, the lift of the governor's stay, the current budget uh, still allocates over $70 million to the police, a 5% increase to their budget. This is a profound failure of imagination. At this very moment, my comrades, your constituents are out in the streets in the middle of a pandemic, fighting for another system that we know is possible that folks around the world are already building. We began that that world is one where violence is not met with, met with rote fear-based decisions to punish. We began this year with emergency evacuations of public housing that had been so horrendously neglected that residents' health and safety was compromised. We began this year with hundreds of evictions every month. And we begin this year with hundreds of people without viable and consistent access to shelter. And that was all pre-COVID-19. And my question is, what else needs to happen for us to prioritize serving people over punishing them? Mayor Shul, in the two years that I lived in your neighborhood, I can recall seeing police cars a total of two times, and I work from home, so I see the streets there a lot. In the month that I've lived in East Durham, I've seen several a day. Just two weeks ago, I and others in our community witnessed the police raid the home of a black family for three hours. They threw a flash bomb in the house with children in it and made the family stand outside with, stand outside mostly without masks for those three hours. And we have several eyewitnesses and video and photo, photographic footage of that um, that um, uh, we will share with the community, the, uh, the family's consent. What I want to say is the bottom line, as the other folks who have um, who spoken before me have mentioned, as the folks who are rallying in the streets tonight have mentioned, is that something has to give. Right, like the, the situation in this country, the situation in this city is not going to get any better um, until we actually decide that what we need is to actually support our community and to prioritize their health and safety and well being over punishing them, throwing them in jail, and, and um, endangering the public health during this pandemic. And so I respectfully, um, uh, you know, advocate against right this increase in the the police budget in favor of reallocating resources that protect our community thank you thank you very much Ms. purifoy uh we have other we have other attendees at the meeting is there any other attendee that would like to speak on the budget if so uh if you would like to put your uh, just put in the chat that you would like to speak and we'll make sure even though you haven't signed up prior that you're able to speak. Is there any other attendee that would like to, to be heard? Okay. I wanna thank all those who spoke on, the, um, on this public hearing. Uh, and uh, uh, hearing no other speakers, I'm gonna declare this public hearing closed. Thank you very much, Ms. Johnson. Colleagues, uh, we've heard the uh, comments on the budget and the capital improvement program. And of course, uh, all of this will be coming for us and we will have all these comments uh, and others that we've received in email um, to be considering as we deliberate on our budget and capital improvement plan.
So I want to thank all the speakers tonight. Our next item is item 22, 600 North Roxborough. And I believe Ms. Struthers may be our, I see, I see Mr. Young. Mr. Young, welcome. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, thank you. Um, it's good to be here tonight. I, um, as you are well aware, we uh, suspended public hearings on zoning annexation amendment items um, following March 16th meeting um, due to concerns about coronavirus and having public hearings in a way that was safe uh, and accessible to the public. And I want to take just a moment to appreciate um, you all, the clerk, the manager's office, technology solutions, and, and public affairs who have worked closely with our excellent staff um, to come up with protocols and notice changes in notice to make sure that um, these um, public hearings for these land use items that are going to commence tonight and go uh, through uh, ne your next regular meeting on March 16th and on three special call, um, special call meetings on June 10th, June 24th, and July 1st are open and accessible to the public. Um, so as you're aware that the clerk has received, um, or, or I, don't know if she's, I don't know if she's received any, but she's had um, the availability of folks to make comments, written comments in advance, and she will provide you any notices she receives in that regard. We also have provided notice for folks um, to, uh, with the notice that went out with this item and all subsequent items, the opportunity to uh, register, pre-register to speak at tonight's meeting. And I know there are some folks that have pre-registered to speak and the, an opportunity for folks to call in uh, live at this meeting. Um, so we, we do believe that um, all, um, so I can certify for the record that uh, required notice was provided or affidavits to that effect on file with the planning department. Uh, and we do believe that um, this item and all subsequent items will be um, fully compliant with law and fully accessible. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Struthers to introduce the case. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Young, and welcome, Ms. Struthers. Good evening. Uh, good evening. I'm Emily Struthers with the Planning Department, and thank you, Pat, for the introduction there. Um, and as Pat stated, uh, this item has been advertised in accordance with state and local law and affidavits of all notices are on file with the planning department. A request for a zoning map change has been received uh, from Tim Sivers with Corvass Associates. This site is 0 0.707 acres and is located generally at 600 North Roxborough Street. The applicant has applied for a zoning map change from residential urban multifamily to residential urban multifamily with the development plan in order to allow for additional density. Key commitments include transit related improvements of a bus pullout and bus shelter, curb extensions for parallel parking spaces, prominent framed entryways on the Roxborough Street frontage, and contributions to the Durham Public Schools and the City Affordable Housing Fund. Additional commitments are identified in the staff report and on the development plan. Uh, two points of clarification within the staff report. Um, the site plan for eight units referenced under item B site history has since been approved. And since the initial writing of the staff report uh, and photos taken, the building has been demolished. The Durham Planning Commission at their November 12, 2019 meeting recommended approval by a vote of nine to four for the proposed residential urban multifamily with a development plan zoning. Staff determines that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan, including the future land use map and other adopted ordinances and plans. Two motions are required for this application. The first is to adopt a consistency statement and the second is for the zoning ordinance. And staff as always is available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Struthers. It's nice to see you again. We've missed you, even if it's only Thank virtual. You. you as well. Um, and I'm now, you've heard the report from staff. I'm now going to declare this public hearing open. And first, I'm going to ask if there are any questions for Ms. Struthers by members of the council. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Reese, and then I count for Mill. Thank you, sir. I had to find my mute button. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, good evening, Ms. Struthers. It is great to see our planning staff again. We have missed you. Our Monday meetings have been bereft of public hearings and your absence was duly noted. I'm glad to get us back to business. I know it'll be a short night for y'all and we'll have a bunch of long afternoons and evenings coming up. <coughs> Excuse me, with respect to this particular zoning change, I wonder if you could help me understand um, what changes have been made to the 
proposal before us since the matter was at the Planning Commission. I asked because uh, Commissioner Miller um, suggested that um, that we should only approve this rezoning if it includes a commitment to include prominent street level entryways or other human scale architectural features along with Roxborough Street. I wonder if you could help me understand what, if anything, the developer has done to address that concern. Thank you. Certainly, thank you for the question. Um, under tax commitment, uh, tax commitment number four, uh, I believe was provided following that planning commission meeting. And that is that the building shall contain one or more prominent framed entryways on the Roxborough Street frontage to create human scale architectural features on the ground floor of the building. And uh, my understanding is that that has addressed that concern. Thank you, that's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member Reese. Council Member Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Ms. Struthers, good evening, good to see you uh, as well. Just a real quick question. H how common is it um, for development plans not to specify whether units will be sale or rental? Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, it is fairly common since the UDO does not, um, doesn't have the ability to keep track of that or regulate that. Um, so we wouldn't be able to enforce that commitment so much. Uh, so it's not common um, in my experience for that to be a commitment or to be identified on the development plan. Right, I'm, I'm, my question is an enforcement or, or, or I, I'm, I'm just curious as to ha does, that ha does that happen often where we get development plans where they don't specify? I don't remember seeing many where I didn't know whether or not they were gonna be for sale or for rent, just from my own experience. I was just wondering how common that was. I haven't seen any myself that specify that. Um, this one does not either. My understanding is that they uh, intend to seek condos, but again, it, it's not specified specifically in the development plan. Gotcha. Yeah, okay. Council Thanks. Member, oh, I'm sorry, Council Member Middleton, if I might what? weigh in, um, Pat Young with Planning Department. Um, state law preempts us from regulating what's called tenure, which is whether a, a structure or building is owner occupied or rental occupied. There have been a few instances where um, there was voluntary proffer that identified that. Um, and that has been accepted and permissible, but it's not something we can require or enforce. So it's, I just wanna emphasize what Ms. Uh, Struther said that it's very, un because of that state law provision, um, it's very unusual that folks offer that. My understanding from um, conversations with the applicant, you can certainly, I would encourage you to discuss this with the applicant when they speak, is um, that these will be apartment style buildings uh, so that that, that, that has a definition under our ordinance about architectural style and features, uh, but that, that it may be condoed, which would allow it to be for sale. So again, you can pursue that with the, um, with the applicant tonight. Thank you. Got, got you, absolutely. Thank you very much. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Thank you, council member. Anyone else have questions for the staff at this time? All right, then we, we will um, now move to hearing from uh, the people that have signed up for the public hearing. Madam Clerk, I believe we have two people signed up, Tim Sivers and John Burns, am I correct? Sir, I have Tim Sivers in attendance. I do not have John Burns. Okay, I see his name as having previously signed up. Uh, if Mr. Burns arrives uh, digitally, uh, we will of course get him in. Um, is there anyone else, Madam Clerk, signed up to speak on this item? No, sir. All right. And um, I'll just ask the attendees, if there are any attendees that would like to speak on this item uh, and have not made yourself known, uh, you can simply put your name in the, uh, in the chat box and we would uh, love to hear from you. Uh, first though, uh, when there only is one speaker that we know of and that's Mr. Tim Sivers. Uh, Mr. Sivers, welcome. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Sivers, uh, you are representing the applicant, is that correct? That is correct, sir. All right. Uh, Mr. Sivers, I'm going to give you five minutes. Uh, I'm not sure how much you'll need, um, and then we can see uh, how much time you need, and also if there are other speakers uh, on the other side of this. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, again, Tim Sivers with Horvath Associates, 16 Consultant Place, Durham, North Carolina. Uh, thank you to Pat and Emily um, and all the staff members that have been able to uh, get these meetings virtually. Um, not only are you excited, but I know the development uh, community in general is excited to uh, to be able to ha have virtual meetings. So 
Um, the first one here is a little nerve wracking, so um, I'm I'm glad uh, I'm glad to uh, get the ball rolling on that item. So you're making you're making history, Mr. Cybers. <laughs> well, I, I, hopefully it's a good way, sir. <laughs> the uh, the request in front of you tonight um, is uh, a change in the rezoning from RUM, which allows the 12 units per acre, to RUMD to maximize the 20 units per acre. Section 6.4.1 of the UDO allows this uh, with, the, with the development plan in order to exceed that 12 unit per acre rate. The project is 0.7 acres. Uh, we've, we have completed and the city has approved as staff mentioned, a site plan to construct eight condominium units on this site, which is permitted by the UDO. This request will maximize the density for a total of up to 14 units, an increase of six units. Planning Commission did approve this request with a vote of nine to four. The members um, who did vote uh, against this project had some concerns with architectural commitments, as you have mentioned, tree coverage and affordable housing, and I'll respond to those moments in momentarily. Before that, I wanna inform you that we did hold a voluntary neighborhood meeting on September 23rd, 2019 at the Durham Convention Center. We only had two neighbors in attendance, um, both which of, uh, were in support of the application. Following that meeting, we had three other adjacent property owners reach out and also provide their support of the project. The development plan uh, that's part of the uh, packet from staff does include uh, commitments to bus stops, architectural design elements, landscape buffers, building and parking setbacks, 70% impervious area, a maximum of 14 units, as well as access points onto Roxborough Street and Mallard Avenue. The development plan also commits to providing curb extensions as requested by the Bike and Ped Commission, as well as upgrading sidewalks and constructing brick bandings on portions of the sidewalks. Those improvements have actually already been included on the approved site plan that staff pre previously mentioned. These condominium units are anticipated to sell for approximately $300 to $350 a square foot, equating to sale prices in the $650,000 up to the $1.25 million range. In response to the comments by two of the Planning Commission members, our team worked with staff to include a text commitment that the design will contain prominent entryways to create human scale architectural features. This is provided as tax commitment number four, as Councilman Reese and uh, Emily had uh, mentioned earlier. In addition to the current commitments, I'd like to adjust two commitments tonight. Uh, first being prior to issuance of the certificate of occupancy, provide a one time $14,000 contribution to the City of Durham Dedicated Housing Fund. First, uh, I should have mentioned prior to that, uh, staff has seen these two additional commitments um, and reviewed them, um, so they are aware of these two commitments. Um, as for the additional um, cost for the Dedicated Housing Fund, after working with the Planning Commission, uh, we delayed our project a little bit to really research the affordable units um, for the location as well as the selling price of these condo units. Our team did agree with Commissioner Johnson's statement that taxpayers' money should not only be used to, or should not be used to subsidize high-cost residential development. However, our team does understand that affordable units are needed in our city, and because this is a higher-cost development, we did want to increase our donation to $1,000 per unit as compared to the standard $100 per unit rate. The second tax, tax commitment I would like to add tonight is to provide a minimum of the 5% tree coverage. Even though our project is exempt from tree coverage, we thought it was important to provide this tree coverage that was requested by the Commissioner Brian, as well as the adjacent property owner. I really, as mentioned earlier, I do really appreciate the ability to have these meetings virtually, and I ask that you vote in favor of the rezoning to add six additional units to this development. If there are any questions, the developer and I are available to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sivers. Um, let me just, uh, I appreciate the uh, a deputy city manager, Wanda Page, has indicated that if you are a person who's called in on telephone um, and is not a smartphone, but you would like to speak, um, you can <laughs> press star nine to raise your virtual hand. So I just want to say that uh, it seems pretty unlikely that that would be the case, uh, but if it is the case, um, you can press star nine to raise your virtual hand. So let me ask, is there anyone here is present here tonight, any of the attendees who would like to speak on this item? You can enter that in the chat box, or if you are attending and calling in on the phone, which is not a smartphone, you can enter star nine. All right, seeing none, I believe that is 
Uh, those are the only people we have to speak, only person we have to speak tonight is Mr. Sivers. Uh, and I'm gonna ask uh, council members if you have any questions uh, or comments for the applicant. I'm sorry, I see none. Uh, so seeing none, I'm gonna close this public hearing and the matter is now before the council. Uh, we would need two motions to approve this item. The first would be a consistency statement. Is there a motion that we approve the consistency statement? Move to approve the consistency statement. Second. Moved by Councilmember Caballero, seconded by Mayor Pro Tem Johnson that we approve the consist approve the consistency statement. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Mayor Shule. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Caballero. Aye. Councilmember Freeman. Aye. Councilmember Middleton. Aye. Councilmember Reese. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. The ayes have it. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Sivers. Thank you very much, Mayor. And and I want to appreciate uh, the fact that a thousand dollars per unit is um, now the standard. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mayor, there's a second item for approval on that. Oh, you sure is. Thank you, Mr. Manager, for that reminder. I think that my, I'll just say, colleagues, I think that my, my ability to miss these items or part of them is even increased in the digital age. And so I appreciate the manager's help and all of you all for helping me uh, keep our parliamentary procedure proceeding. So we have another motion necessary to adopt an ordinance amending the UDO. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Moved by Mayor Pro Tem, seconded by Council Member Caballero. Council, uh, Ma Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mayor Shule. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Aye. Council Member Caballero. Aye. Council Member Freeman. Aye. Council Member Middleton. Aye. Council Member Reese. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, we'll now move to item 27, FY 2021 stormwater rates. Uh, we will be receiving a presentation on this, conducting a public hearing, and then I, and then adopting the ordinance to change the fee schedule. So first, um, we'll hear, I believe, from Mr. Wheatley. Mayor Shul, Mayor Pro Tem Johnson and Council, Paul Wheatley Public Works. Um, this item proposes to raise stormwater rates for fiscal year FY 2021, effective July 1, 2020. Uh, the presentation you're referring to was received at the work session. Um, yes. We have two other items. One is to conduct a public hearing to receive public comment on the proposed FY 2021 rates. And the second one is to eventually, hopefully, adopt an ordinance to change the fee schedule revising stormwater rates effective July 1, 2020. The public hearing was advertised in the Durham Herald Sun, and we have an affidavit to attest to that for May 12th and May 19th. Notices were also placed on the City of Durham website as well as at Durham City Hall. And, and, and on the website, it was at multiple locations, and all notices included an email address of stormwater rate at durhamnc.gov to provide comments. Comments received to date will be read by staff at, your, at when you desire. Comments will be accepted. Uh, legis the legislature required us to go at least through June 2nd to receive comments, and if your desire is to go longer than that, that is certainly as the clerk indicated, they were accepting comments longer than that, the 24 hours after the public hearing. Um, this item does propose to raise stormwater rates. Um, the rates for tier one would increase by 24 cents per month, for tier two would be 50 cents per month, and tier three would be $1 per month. The non-residential rate would increase by 50 cents per ERU, which is 2,400 square feet for impervious surface. The annual impact for rate repairs would be, for tier one would be slightly less than $3 per year. Uh, for tier two would be $6 per year. And tier three residential would be $12 per year. And the effect for commercial property would be at an additional $6 per ERU or 2,400 square feet of impervious cover. The stormwater fund is a utility in that its primary source of revenue is from stormwater fees. Um, 
rates for all tiers are middle of the pack that I proposed when compared with our benchmark cities as reflected in the presentation at the work session. The pro proposed increase supports capital funding for stormwater retrofits that comply with our Falls, Falls Lakes stage one reduction goals, as well as to begin to address our pollutant load reduction requirements for Third Fork and Northeast Creeks. Um, with that, that concludes my summary. We have worked with the uh, finance department to develop these rates through the stormwater rate model and identifying the projects up through FY 2019. Uh, with that, um, I'm here to support you and with this uh, public hearing. Thank you, Mr. Weebke. Very, very, very much appreciate it. Uh, Council, member, uh, Council members, you have heard Mr. Weebke's presentation, uh, and I'm now going to declare this public hearing open. And first, ask are there any questions for Mr. Weebke by members of the Council? All right, thank you. And uh, we, we did have a good chance to discuss this at our work session. Um, Mr. Weebke, you said that you had received, we, we did, uh, as Councilmember Freeman mentioned, we already received one uh, item uh, comment by email previously. Did you also receive comment, Mr. Weebke, that we had not received that you would like to put in the record? I received uh, a comment from uh, Jennifer Buzzin. Um, and I okay. can read that now if you like, or? Sure, yes, that would be fine. All right. Uh, from Jennifer Buzzin to Durham City Council, as a resident of Durham and environmental engineer and a former employee of the Stormwater and GIS Division of the Public Works Department, I urge City Council to support the proposed FY 2021 stormwater rates. The rate increase is due mainly to efforts needed to comply with the Falls Lake Stage 1 existing development requirements and to begin to address total maximum daily loads, TMDL's reduction requirement. I support the rate increase for the following reasons. The requirements to address to be addressed by the rate increase and its associated water quality improvement measures have been in effect for a while. The city of Durham must make more progress toward addressing them as the problems the requirements target have not been sufficiently alleviated. Falls Lake stage one existing development requirements became effective in January, 2011. The third Fort Creek sediment TMDL was approved by EPA in 20, 2005. The Northeast Creek Bacteria TMDL was approved by EPA in 2003. The City of Durham's National Pollution Discharge Elimination System, or NPDS permit, mandates that we take steps to address these requirements. The City's compliance with our permit will be audited in the future, and we do not want to come up short. The City's stormwater program has a strong reputation among North Carolina regulatory officials because this reputation often gains us a seat at the table when new studies and regulations are being discussed, it is, our, it is to our advantage to maintain that reputation. The water quality improvement measures which necessitate the rate increase will ensure that the city stays on the leading edge of the municipal stormwater field. Thank you for consideration of these comments. Jennifer Buzzin, PE, 3206 Portland Drive, Durham, North Carolina. Thank you very much, Mr. Wiebke. Is there anyone else who is an attendee on this call that would like to speak on this item? If so, please, uh, you could put simply put your name in the chat, if so. <clears throat> and we'll just wait a minute for that. All right. Uh, I hear no other uh, speakers, I see no other speakers to this item. And I'm going to declare the public hearing closed. Uh, the matter is now before the council. We're being asked to adopt an ordinance to change the fee schedule revising stormwater rates effective on July 1st, 2020. And I have a motion to that effect. Move for approval. Move approval. Is there a second? Second. And moved by Mayor Pro Tem and seconded by Council Member Caballero that we adopt the ordinance to change the fee schedule revising the stormwater rates. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Mayor Shule. <laughs> Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Caballero. Aye. Councilmember Freeman. No. Council, Councilmember Middleton. Aye. Councilmember Reese. Aye. 
Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, the motion passes five to one. Colleagues, uh, uh, at this time, there being no more business Mr. to come before Mr. this Mayor, item, item 12 uh, was skipped. Oh, what was it, Mr. Manager? That was the uh, uh, water and sewer rates, general business. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. One more time, I needed correction, and I'm grateful to you, Mr. Manager. I almost adjourned without it. My apologies. The general business agenda, proposed water and sewer rates to... Uh, yeah, so we'll hear from staff. Mr. Greeley, I'm sorry, I apologize. Almost didn't set any water and sewer rates this year. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, members of council, uh, Don Greeley, Water Management. Um, the item before you is the proposed water and sewer rates for FY uh, 2021. Um, per our discussion at uh, the city county work session, um, staff went and um, did some further analysis and explanations, which we've attached with in, in additional information memo um, which I hope you've had a chance to review. Um, we've also had an opportunity to um, revise the rates since the decision for the paper performance this coming year um, that uh, equated to a reduction of $1.2 million um, dollars in the proposed budget. Um, we were able to then bring the proposed rates for a typical tier three customer from 2.9% uh, down to 2.1%. Um, the other, que other major question that came out of council was the discussion about the positions that were proposed um, for the upcoming year. Um, the department still considers them mission critical. Um, the total value of, of those positions is 755,000, of which 120,000 are the four vehicles. Um, the, if those positions were not uh, approved to go forward, then the rate would be able to be reduced from 2.1 to 1.7%. Um, the difference for a tier one customer between a 1.7% rate increase and a 2.1% rate increase for a tier one customer um, per month is three cents. And with that, I'd like to op uh, for, uh, open the floor for any questions by city council. Thank you very much, Mr. Greeley. Um, this is not a public hearing item, so uh, colleagues, uh, I'll ask if there are any questions for Mr. Greeley or any comments. All right. Uh, we heard um, Mr. Greeley's presentation. Uh, Councilmember Freeman, did you have some comments or questions? Just a comment. <laughs> Just acknowledging that in this time, I'm a little concerned about raising the rates and I can't and good conscience move forward um, at this time, but um, I just wanted to voice that out there. Thank you, Council Member. Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I'm a little confused about the order of these decisions. Like we're, are, we're setting the rates before we approve the budget to authorize the additional positions. So, if we were to go, if we were to decide not to authorize those additional positions, would we then have another action to go back and lower the rate? I'm I'm not sure. Um, until we have the discussion about the positions, I'm not sure what to do about this item and and setting the rate. You're you're muted. If uh, council, um, you know, it's your your call. This is in the past we have typically handled the rate uh, adjustments prior to adopting the budget, but you certainly could uh, adopt this uh, ordinance um, and, and the rate structure the same night that you adopt the budget. You know, can ask Bertha just to be sure I'm, I'm thinking that right. I think there ha we have done that in years past, although I must admit in the last several years, I think we've done it prior to finalizing the budget. And part of that I think is just the accumulating the all of the budget documents as they're correct instead of doing it kind of on the floor. Sure, I think that, I mean, at least in, you know, my tenure, this is the only year that we've had this sort of budget situation. And so I think I would feel more comfortable having the conversation about positions so that we have more information in order to set the correct rate. Um, colleagues, any more comments on that? Um, 
Mr. Manager, would you be comfortable uh, if we held it and voted on it the same night as we did voted on the budget? Well, Mr. Mayor, so the only the, the, the challenge will be the ability to calculate a new rate on the on the floor. I see what you're saying. Yeah, it, it is. Uh, it, would, it would really be next to impossible. I mean, you could certainly adopt the the rate structure the way you have it and then not approve the positions. And then those monies would just be you know, held held with uh, in, in some re other reserve capacity for future years adjustments. But it would be very difficult to, uh, you know, depending on on which positions you would approve or not to, to you know, calculate, yeah, calculate that just, you know, I don't want to say on the fly, but on the floor. <laughs> sure. Understood. Understood. Uh, I see Councilmember Middleton's hand. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. And then I, 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 I did I beat Charlie? Okay, I, you recognize me. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I saw Charlie's hand as well. I, um, I was the one who asked a question about the mission, the uh, mission critical question, and and I appreciate um, the response, uh, Don. It seems to me uh, the answer was parsed along. Um, it seems to me an answer about improved customer service and regulatory issues. And I guess in my mind, the rubric that I was operating under um, at our last meeting was. Uh, efficiency and value added are are extremely important, but I I don't know that I would put those under mission critical in this context. Now the regulatory issues, which I think there are three positions attached to us meeting our regulatory standards. Is that correct? That there are three positions that will address regulatory issues. Uh, yes, and th that they equate roughly two hundred and forty one thousand of the seven hundred and fifty five thousand. Right. I guess for me, if, if if the rate increase is being driven by an anticipation that we're going to go ahead and just pass the additional FTEs, then I don't know how much punting to the night where we adopt is, is going to be helpful to the same night. Adopting the uh, rate and the this is the same night it seems to me we're at a crossroads where we need to make a, a decision as a council as to whether or not we're going to, you know, line by line, if we find these um, positions uh, justifiable if they are in fact the driving force or at least the major driving force behind the rate increase i'm prepared to say tonight i i would be willing uh, to consider the three uh regulatory related uh positions but i would probably need some more coaxing in terms of the other which undoubtedly add value and increase efficiency i'm not i'm not doubting the the wisdom of the positions at all i want to be very clear about that but i do think in our current climate uh, you know, I'm averse to raising rates or, you know, taxes on folk like all of us are. Um, and if, if that's what's driving this rate increase for the most part, the, all those 11 positions, then um, I think I would place more priority on the three, which are connected to regulatory uh, standards. Um, but that's that's just my position. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Reese. Sometimes it's hard to find that mute button when it's your turn. Um, so what the the rate has to be set before the start of the new fiscal year, is that right? Uh, ideally, yes. Okay. Um, is there something keeping us from uh, addressing that at a special meeting after the adoption of the budget? I mean, we're going to adopt the budget somewhere in the neighborhood of I think two weeks before the end of the fiscal year. Um, after we make a decision about the positions, there should be sufficient time to calculate the new rate. Um, I don't know how long it would take, a week, whatever it takes, um, and then come back to us for a special session just to just to pass the uh, the firm, the water and sewer rate. Um, typically, when we pass the rates, they um, are in effect July one, with the first billing to occur in August. So it'd be a question of um, if we still want to push the um, have the same kind of month in advance notice of when we actually adopt the rates um, that affects how much revenue we do get and could actually drive the rates up a little bit if we try to recover them all in one year. We already have a special meetings scheduled uh, for other purposes. Uh, Mr. Manager, uh, no, that's what what I was, was going to mention that, Mr. Mayor, as well. That, you know, I think we've got two or three special meetings following the adoption of the uh, the budget, and and both of those are prior to July first. At least one two of them. One of them, of them is July first, actually, which would still be all right. All right. 
Well, let me just then ask you, Mr. Manager, you can hear uh, the council's uh, uh, interest in the situation with these positions. I don't think we have a consensus yet. I know we don't have a consensus yet, but there's more discussion wanted. Uh, for you and Mr. Greeley, what's your comfort level with adopting the budget as we usually do? And then after adopting that budget, when we'll have taken up the question of the positions, we would then come back and set the rates at a meeting between when we adopted the budget and the end of June. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I think ideally, uh, because we do have the budget reconciliation item on the work session for Thursday, uh, acknowledging it's a long, it'll be a long meeting in any event, but I think it's possible that, you know, that we could reconcile that even Thursday. Okay. You know, we, we may not have it rather than at the final budget adoption night on the 15th. So uh, that would give us some time if, uh, if we need longer than the 15th to calculate the rate, then we could possibly do that later in the month. But if everyone's willing to, to reconcile those decisions Thursday, I think we can figure out a way to get it done. Uh, th that would be great, Mr. Manager. And then that could just be a priority item for viewers. Well, yes, I think the, uh, the budget reconciliation item is already on the agenda. Okay. This, this would just be, you know, adding a, a, another component to that, uh, that agenda item. Thank you a lot. All right, colleagues, that's the way we'll proceed. Uh, Mr. Greeley, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Manager. And uh, we'll look forward to uh, talking about that more. Um, I can tell there's some differences of opinion and that's a good thing. Mr. Mayor, thank you very much. One last question. I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor. Sure, sorry. yeah, go ahead, Council that's, Member. Don, Don, sorry, not trying to hold you up. One last question. Uh, are, how, how many, if any, um, FTE slots do you have in your org chart that are not currently filled? Um, I think we have about 22. Or there about 22? Around, around okay. 22 from... Go ahead. I think Don's frozen up. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really have offers out. Don, Don could you say that again? We, we missed you. Sure. I'm, I'm sorry. It seems to be having a, some internet connection problems here. Um, at somewhere around 22, 23 positions that aren't that are vacant and currently being advertised that we have not made offers to individuals. Okay. What's the longest one? What's the longest amount of time one has been open? Uh, I I would have to get that. We've closed some of the longer ones recently with offers, so I can provide that to you. Okay. Thanks much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. Don, thank you so much. And we'll see you um, at the work session. Great. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, so, Mr. Mayor, uh, officially, I guess, let's uh, can we refer that item back to the administration then? Um, sure. Since we won't know exactly which meeting to, to bring it forth, but we'll be the, bringing it forth. Yes, we can. In the month. Thank yep. You. We'll refer that back to the administration and ask for their guidance. Thank um, you. Colleagues, this reminds me, the work session, I, I sent an email to everybody about this, but we have a big work session. So if you if there are items on which you have uh, major questions, of course, as usual, bring them up and anything you feel the need to bring up to pull from the agenda on that day. Um, but I'm urging everyone, if you have small questions or you know little items that you can get solved before the session, uh, to please send emails to our staff uh, and so maybe we can avoid pulling as many uh, items as we would normally, the normal proportion given this large agenda. So just urging everybody to try to do as much of that as ahead of time as we can. Mr. Manager, have I finally finished all the items? Yes, sir. Okay. I'm sorry about that last one. There being no other business to come before this city council tonight, I'm going to declare the meeting to uh, adjourned at 828. And colleagues, I look forward to seeing you on Thursday. Everybody stay safe. A nice Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thursday, Good night, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Good night.